Luke chapter 4, and by the way, I told you your assignment is to read Matthew 11 every day. And you'll understand more about that as you read it this afternoon sometime, and you'll hook it back to what we're talking about. You see, in Luke chapter 4, it tells us in the opening verse of Luke chapter 4 that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan River, being urged by the Spirit out into the barren wastelands of Judea, where Satan tempted him for 40 days. And you read the encounter, and you've heard many sermons on the temptation of Jesus. But it says in verse 14, after those 40 days, Jesus returned to Galilee, full of the Holy Spirit's power. Very interesting. He went out there full of the Holy Spirit. He came back full of the Holy Spirit's power. And soon he was well known throughout all that region for his sermons in the synagogues. Everyone praised him. Now Jesus had a habit that when it came worship day, which for them was Saturday, when there was a worship day, he went to the synagogue. Occasionally I'm not in this pulpit. And when I come back, people always say, did you go to church last Sunday? Of course. Of course. We need the worship. We need to be together. I spoke to a lady that's sitting in this service. I buried her husband some months ago, and I said, I'm so glad you're here. And she said, Buf, I can't make it without coming and to be energized by the service and the preaching of the word and the music. Jesus understood that for him it was important to go and worship. And so it was pattern of his life. I appreciate it when you go and worship. You're kind of you're kind of funny. It's kind of interesting how people do cuz people come and they bring me church bulletins from some place where they went. See, they want me to know for sure they worshiped. And I like that. And I like to see other people's church bulletins and I give them to Hillary and say, "Here, if there's something here they're doing better than we're doing it, let's find a way to change what we're doing, doing it this way." But I, I hope that you go someplace to worship, not to go and compare with Northwest. Go to worship. Go to say, they're going to do it different. It's not going to have that much life. And they may play tapes when their singers sing and all that kind of foolishness, you know. But I'm going to go and worship and, and I'm going to let God speak to me while I'm there. Jesus did that. Now, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual, see that, as usual, to the synagogue on Saturday and stood up to read the scriptures. Now let me tell you how they did this thing. See, there was one temple, it was in Jerusalem. But they had a, a rule that wherever there were 10 Jewish families, they established a synagogue. Now that was no problem in Nazareth because it was full of Jews. But out throughout the Roman Empire, you read over and over again, and he went to the synagogue, the synagogue, the synagogue. Always these 10 Jewish families, and they would have a leader, a rabbi, and he would have an assistant, and they would run services every week. Now, the format of the service, there were no paid employees. The format of the service was to call on teachers who were there, rabbis, same word, same old, same old, and have them read and teach. And the way they did, they stood to read the scriptures, everyone did. And then they sat down and the teacher sat down and taught from a sitting position. I do better when I'm standing up, even if I'm not preaching, I'm just teaching. I want to walk around, my brain works better when I'm walking around. But they sat down. And here it says that here Jesus is in Nazareth, his boyhood home. He stood up to read the scriptures and he read from the book of Isaiah. That was what was handed to him. They had him on those scrolls. They handed him this scroll, and he rolled that open to Isaiah chapter 61, and here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to announce that captives shall be released and the blind shall see that the downtrodden shall be freed from their oppressors and that God is ready to give blessings to all who come to him. What a great passage. What a marvelous passage. And Jesus read that passage, short scripture reading for the day. Read it, rolled it up, handed it to the attendant, and he sat down. And everyone in the synagogue gazed at him intently. My, doesn't he read well? You hear those wonderful tones of his voice. 
Hmm. And then Jesus said something that just about blew the doors off the place. Jesus said, these scriptures came true today. Now, folks, you weren't there. See, we weren't there. And we can't put ourselves there really to feel the impact of that thing. But just think about this. He has just read an Old Testament prophecy which they knew. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to announce that captives shall be released, the blind shall see, the downtrodden shall be freed from their oppressors, and that God is ready to give blessings to all who come to him. These scriptures came true today. I'm it! They're sitting there saying, my, isn't this a nice young man? He's 30. Back in that situation, you were 30, you were just a young man. Doesn't he do well? And then these scriptures came true today. And immediately they doubted his credibility. Where is he? He's in Nazareth. It's the town that he grew up in. And immediately they say, hey, how can this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? See, they'd never gotten the message. Jesus was not Joseph's son. Joseph was the guardian. Joseph was not the father. Oh, listen. This town, they talk just like they do in any town of 15, 20,000 people. See, we have a notion that Nazareth, that, that Nazareth was probably a little village, 136 people. We have this little notion they had several little mud huts and that was, ha, huh, this is 15 or 20,000 people that live in Nazareth where Jesus grew up and worked in the carpenter's shop under the direction of Joseph. They'd heard all the stories. They'd done all the talking on the back step. <laughs> yeah, you know, Joe and Mary got together and, and they gave this deal, you know, about the, uh, the uh, you know, the Holy Spirit and, and it wasn't. They never believed that in that town. They believed Jesus was the illegitimate offspring of Joseph and Mary. Much prior to marriage that he showed up. And here he is saying this day the scripture is fulfilled. And suddenly they doubt his credentials. And then he keeps teaching. Listen to this. Probably you will quote me that proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning why don't you do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum up the road some distance? But I solemnly declare to you that no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. For example, and then he gives two examples of stories they knew very well. You may not know these stories very really well, but they knew these stories very well. He tells them the story of Elijah, the prophet, out of 1 Kings chapter 17. They knew this well. Elijah had been told by God, tell him that there's not going to be any rainfall for several years, no dew, no rain. And when he'd made this announcement, the Lord said to Elijah, I want you to uh, go down and hide by the brook Cherith at a place east of where it enters the Jordan River and drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you for I've commanded them to feed you. Now this business of being in full-time Christian work, a lot of folks don't understand, has some hazards. Go down there and drink from the brook and I'll send the ravens to bring you bread and meat morning and night, it says. Last time I checked, the ravens were eating roadkill. Huh? I'm not sure what they brought him, but it says in the next verse, they brought him bread and meat each morning and evening and he drank from the brook. And then the brook dried up. And God said, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. There's a widow there who will feed you. I've given her my instructions. Zarephath, that is out of the Israeli section. This is a foreigner. 
Jesus makes the statement here in Luke 4. He said, I remember Elijah used a miracle to help the widow of Zarephath, a foreigner from the land of Sidon. There were many Jewish widows needing help in those days of famine. For there had been no rain for three and a half years, and hunger stalked the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to them. See, when you go back to this story in 1 Kings 17, he showed up, and he asked this woman for a cup of water. And then he said, bring me a bite of bread, too. And she turned and said, I swear by the Lord your God, I have a single piece of bread in the house. I have only a handful of flour left and a little cooking oil at the bottom of the jar. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I must die of starvation. See, when people talk about starvation, we don't like to think about it because we eat so well. Looking at that little note in the paper the other day, Sandy Patty was just in Ethiopia, and she said as she cradled one of those children dying of hunger cradled that child in her arms. She feared that she would crush that child because it was just a bag of bones with skin stretched over it. Dying across this world, people are dying of starvation daily by the thousands. And here was a woman who was facing starvation, widow woman, one child, out of everything, no visible means of support. She said, we're going to eat one meal and die. And Elijah said, don't be afraid. Go and cook that last meal, but bake me a little loaf first. What an obnoxious guy, huh? <laughs> who does he think he is? The prophet of God? Exactly. And he said, you bake that for me first and afterwards there'll still be enough food for you and your son. For the Lord God of Israel says, there will always be plenty of flour and oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. And she did, as Elijah said, and they continue to have supply. <coughs> Great story. They knew this story. They liked this story. Why? A foreigner. That's what she was. You didn't take the grace of God and offer it to foreigners. You had to be a Jew in their minds to get in on it. Never in the mind of God. Keep that straight. Never in the mind of God. Only in the mind of those who were locked into that system that didn't want anybody interrupting that system. He went on to tell the other story. Prophet Elisha, who healed old Naaman, who was a commander in Syria outside the boundaries again. That's in 2 Kings 5. The guy had leprosy. He had a little servant girl in his house who was Jewish. And she said one day, I only wish that my master would go and see the prophet. He would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went down there. I mean, he went down ready to pay, folks. He went down. He had $20,000 in gold. In silver, $60,000 in gold, and 10 suits of clothing. He is ready to do prepay for this healing deal. And as he went down there, and he finally went to the gate of, of Elijah, and uh, of Elisha, went to the gate, and stated his business, and Elisha sent his servant out, and said, uh, tell him to go down to the Jordan River, and dip in there seven times, and he'll be healed of every trace of his leprosy. And Naaman blew up. At least the guy could have come to the door himself. Sends a servant to the door, tells me to go and wash in the Jordan River. We've got two rivers in Syria that are clean and beautiful and wonderful, and that muddy, miserable thing called the Jordan. There's no way I'm going down there. And he went away angry, and his soldiers said, Look, General, what do you got to lose? Give it a whirl. Went down, dipped seven times, and came up clean. Leprosy gone. Now, Jesus reminded them of that story. And when he finished that story, saying, there are plenty of lepers in Israel that needed help that never got any help. The remarks stung them to fury. And jumping up, they mobbed Jesus and took him to the edge of the hill on which the city was built to push him over the cliff. This is opening day of his ministry. You talk about dramatics on opening day. 
The whole deal is dramatic from start to finish. They are ready to kill him when just a little while before they were saying, my, isn't he wonderful? Doesn't he read well? Intonation is perfect, absolutely beautiful. And I look at how quickly the crowd moved from one thing to the other, and I ask us some questions. You see, when Jesus talked about the poor and the blind and the oppressed and the brokenhearted, when we think about that, we always think economically. We talk about world impact. We need to buy some of those circus tickets to help them with their ministry in the inner city. Yes, those are, the, those are the poor. Those are the oppressed. Truly they are. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you've got a good arm, you can stand in many places in this end of town and throw rocks in four different directions and hit houses and have people in them who are poor and who are oppressed and who are brokenhearted and who are blind to the things of God. We've got to get out of this think that the gospel is for those who are economically poor. It is for them as well, but even more than that, it is for all men everywhere who will acknowledge their need. And the question is this, to whom are we reaching out to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do we look at those around us who may be well fixed financially, they may be in a great shape with all the stuff that they have, but their soul is absolutely bankrupt, and we don't even see that. The other question, are we stuck in the same kind of rut that the Nazareth crowd is stuck in? That we're not about to let God accomplish his work through us. You know, you would think you would think that these folks in Nazareth would say, isn't this incredible? God Almighty has given us the unique and wonderful privilege to have the Messiah come here and make the declaration of his life in this synagogue, in this town where he grew up. Praise God, we're blessed. They want to take him out and kill him. And look what it says in verse 30. And this is a sad statement. He walked away through the crowd and left them. Question. Have you thought about how tragic it would be if Jesus would elect to just pass through Fresno and go his way? See, I believe that God is uniquely interested in this area and is in the middle of getting his work done. And I believe that he has called us uniquely to be a part of his moving force in getting things done across this community. Inner city, you bet. Suburbs, wealthy suburbs with those who are poor and oppressed and blind and brokenhearted, you bet. But my question is this, how are you involved in the ministry of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around you that are in need? Take courage, take courage from Jesus Christ himself and step up and make the declaration that you need to make that would turn folks from their point of need to their place of finding their need to be met in and through him. Oh, I pray that you read Matthew 11 this week. And I pray that if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ, that you would allow us the privilege to help you. We put a card in the rack, you fill it out and turn it in, we'll have somebody sit with you and help you to find your way to the Savior. That's a simple way to do it. Simple because we don't put you on a spot, but we certainly bring the truth when you give us opportunity. Do that as I pray. Would you stand with me and let's pray and be dismissed. Help us, our Father, as we go from here to think about the courage of Jesus. 
to face a hostile crowd, to know going in, these folks are not going to honor me. I'm a prophet in my own country, and they're just going to tell me to drive on. I thank you for his demonstration, great courage, great skill in reminding people of how you have been available to all who would come your way. We offer Jesus Christ as the answer to those who are in this service struggling to figure out what life is all about. Help us, our Father, to take every opportunity, both organizationally and individually, in this community. Don't let us be stuck in a rut. And I'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Hope to see you around somewhere this week.